Last season, everyone was talking about Brighton and Hove Albion, and can you blame them because they were playing really exciting football under Roberto De Zerbi? But this season, things are a little bit different. Things may be tailed off a bit, and some people are raising the question, have Brighton been found out? Well, fortunately, I'm joined by someone who can help me answer that question, because Liam Tharm is not just a Brighton fan, but he's one of the athletics tactics experts as well. You have been following Brighton home and away. You've seen them in the stadium, so... Hopefully, lots of insight into Brighton. Yeah, definitely. A, a first European campaign for the club and trying to balance a best of a Premier League finish last season, trying to compete at the same levels while trying to be a competitive and successful European team. It's definitely trying to find a way. So let's just start off by talking about the basics of what Brighton are trying to do. And mm. we've made loads of videos on this so people can go and check out the, the finer details if they want to. But I had a, an interview recently with Adam Lallana and Graham Hunter on his podcast, just talking about the general principle of what Brighton are trying to do in possession and what Lalana says is the, the most basic principle is they're trying to get the opposition baited forward so you'll often see the centre back standing with their foot on the ball and what that does is it means that the opposition will often all push up high up the field because they're being baited into the press and this creates a lot of space at the back that then Brighton are going to try and attack and the way they're going to do that according to Lalana, is by finding the free man and what he means by that is building through these lines of pressure last season we saw it happening loads where you, you see these passes into one of the double pivot players who can then just bounce the pass immediately into the feet of, of his partner. And then what you have here now is the ability to, to play these really aggressive balls in behind in maybe in the wide areas. You may have the, the forwards dropping deep here. So this is the general principle of what they're trying to do. Bait the opposition forward, create three men, and then what you get is you, you generate these 3v3s, 4v4s against the back line and you have really dangerous personnel to be able to make the most of it. But I think this season we've seen things slightly different happening because mm. I think teams are starting to respond to this type of build-up, right? Yeah, and Brighton have also lost Alexis McAllister and Moises Caicedo in, in central midfield who played the vast majority of Roberto De Zerbi's games together. So he's had to chop and change his central midfield combinations a lot more now and that obviously makes you know playing in a pattern-based way a bit more difficult. We've seen teams press them slightly differently. Manchester United um, press them with sort of almost a, a front three with, with two strikers and then a number tend to sit um, to sit sort of between the, the two central midfielders so they just responded by splitting the centre backs wider uh, and of course then could push the full backs up as well and that would pin the wingers deeper and then suddenly they could get out by dribbling forward with the ball and they could bypass pressure that way and we see that in the almost the build up to quite a few of the goals um, at Old Trafford. So the other thing we saw in Marseille who completely sat off Brighton at least right from the start uh, was they dropped their two strikers really onto the double pivot and then pushed their central midfielders up to, to double up and basically have a four on two here. Brighton struggled to build up in sort of the first two or three instances so they dropped a midfielder out between to try and add some more superiority. They could split the centre-backs wider and that way they could try and play direct into the strikers. Problem being, because they had a 4v4 on the back line, the centre-backs would step out and be tight and aggressive. And when Brighton lost the ball, they suddenly didn't have really anyone in central midfield to counter-press and Marseille could play through them. So the change in the second half was, instead of bringing the central midfield deeper here, uh, he got moved further forward and then you could basically create a front five which made more of an issue for Marseille because they no longer had the man-for-man -man opportunity to follow players tightly and then when you had Billy Gilmore in these positions here he could receive from the centre back and try and pass into players into the half spaces. So what we're seeing is maybe a slightly different way of building up but finding solutions so we've already talked about how they could make these uh, wider areas more dangerous not necessarily having to go through the middle we've also talked a little bit about going more direct mm -hmm. so seeing the goalkeeper being willing to actually play the ball straight into the front line um, do you want to talk a little bit about that so often we'll see uh, effectively a, a six here and a four here because they bring the, the double pivot so deep and what the opportunity then presents itself is actually to go direct and going behind often that can be still playing short to Lewis Duncan as a right footer playing off the left he naturally finds it a bit more awkward to sort of try and play progressive passes on his left into feet. He might just chip it straight in behind to Karim Matoma, trying to get him to run in behind the, the fullback. And at times we've seen that from Jason Steele, um, once against Brentford last season as an assistant. There was a similar assist for Sumana Dingra uh, in pre-season. So that is definitely an option. Matoma often has, has players for pace. And at times he might even try and drop it onto the striker and then try and set in this way into midfield for a runner from there. So it sounds as though from what you're saying is that Brian are sort of roughly around where they they were in terms of the attacking style of play uh, in, in possession they've got different routes to be able to do the same sort of thing so baiting op opponents forward but finding the, the routes through finding the free men and being able to attack mm. uh, the back line and I think that shows up fairly nicely in the underlying numbers as well right so we've got the underlying numbers from last season versus this season here and we've got the in possession stuff at the top and the out of possession stuff at the bottom but let's, let's just talk about the in possession stuff so what stands out for you everything roughly 
pretty good from what I'm looking at. Yeah, the fact that it stayed fairly consistent and not just the, the numbers and the output themselves, but when you look at the league rank and how they're comparing is also really, really important. I mean, they're on the longest scoring consecutive streak in the Premier League, which when you consider the quality that Man City, Liverpool, etc., have, that is really, really impressive. And they're up to, you know, over two goals a game. Uh, they're consistently scoring three or more times in games. So against certain opposition, when they, when they get it right and when the tactical plan works, and particularly against teams that press them, i.e. we see this often against the big six teams that really come out at them, they can score goals and they can rack up really, really big scores. We see, you know, 3-1 wins, 4-1 uh, wins. I think they've had more 3-1 wins under De Zerbi than 1-0 wins in the Premier League, which just kind of sums up uh, the, the attacking style. But it's the out-of-possession stuff that's a little bit more concerning here, right? Yeah, I think so. And this is particular, not just in sort of the, the Premier League, because uh, as the biggest critique of them, uh, in terms of sort of their ranking, even in terms of the shots and stuff that they're facing, the shots on target, they're still a really high ranking defence. Um, their XGA, even as it's had a bit of a drop of the season um, and they're facing more big chances, but these are still mid-table at worst, which if you consider that your attack is, you know, going from even top four to still in the top six, uh, it's more than good enough. You're going you're gonna to compensate. If you were to average that out, you're still looking at being a sort of a, a top eight team, which is more than good enough. But I think the, the clean sheet is, is definitely, um, or the absence of any clean sheets is more of a problem when you look at it from a European perspective, because they're now playing tournament football as well. Of course, they have to ban it, uh, manage the loading of the games and, and the personnel and make rotations, but it's a lot harder to be a successful team in Europe if you are conceding more goals. They don't always need to go and win games 3-1, 4-1, 5-1. They can get away with winning games 1-0 or 2-0 like we saw against Ajax, but ensuring really that they don't rack up huge amounts of big chances faced, which has gone up this season, um, you know, facing more shots can be an even bigger problem uh, in Europe than it can in the Premier League. Well, we've got a shot map here. We've got this season's information on this side and then last season's data on the other side. Just talk us through what you can see here. I think so. The, the the numbers in terms of comparison are interesting because they're they're largely similar. The, the goals against is up um, a, a fair bit, and of course you can look at this one of two ways in that they're conceding more now than they were uh, relative to the XG that they're conceding. Um, last season, that was the other way around, so you can put that down to wasteful opposition finishing, um, good goalkeeping, a, a combination of the two. And the XG per shot being the same, I think, can, from a broader perspective, make it look like, oh, things are fine. They're conceding the same quality of chances overall, but... I think it's a combination of conceding some real big chances. I mean, I know there's only one sort of inside the six-yard box, but really in that second six-yard box area where they can concede a lot of cutbacks. Um, we saw it against Aston Villa in particular, against Marseille, and that teams can get in behind them in those fullback zones and can pull those low, low crosses. And when the back four get exposed and they retreat to you know defend the goal, there is that space for those one-touch finishes there. So... In addition to that, you're looking at quite a few uh, really good finishes from distance. I think Haaland had one recently in their, their loss against Manchester City. So those ones, I think, outside the box, you can't always do an awful lot about. But definitely having a bit of an issue in terms of conceding big chances, even if they are also giving up some real low quality chances. So I just guess I'm not entirely sure how representative that average is. Um, I think it's really good chances they're conceding and some really bad ones as well. Yeah, and there's clearly some big chances that you've got a little bit lucky with in, in that six yard box, just not, not coming off. And you've already mentioned how vulnerable they have been through the fullback areas. We've got a nice viz here just showing you the areas where chances have been conceded against for Brighton and as you can see in particular this right back area uh, a lot of chances coming through that area. Yeah I mean De Zerbi through sort of injuries and also through rotations had to play uh, Joel Veltman, James Milner, Tarek Lamptey uh, all at right back. Lamptey's played at left back as well um, as has Pervis Stupinan before his injury. Uh, Solly March recently played there against Liverpool and then he got injured himself so they're really trying to find a balance out wide and part of the issue is that because they play with wingers as such an important part of their system and want them high and wide by tucking the fullbacks in you do leave these spaces really sort of into the half spaces into the wide spots that can be targeted with those direct balls West Ham were a really good example of doing that in transition Aston Villa were too and I think it just comes down the fact that on the right side at times they've had a midfielder playing in there or not a pure sort of defensive um uh, a fullback and at times at centre back they've had Adam Webster in there um, perhaps over Jan Paul Van Hecker so Webster's probably a better ball progressor but not quite as physical not quite as big so they can give up quite a lot here and you, you can see really the, the depth as well it's not just the proportion there but how many are coming from these sort of cutback zones uh, well into the penalty area mm. and we've also already mentioned that 
when you get into settled possession, you're pushing a, a centre midfielder forward, uh, and that centre midfielder pushing forward is almost always on the right hand side as well, which I guess would make that right hand side, as we look at it, a little bit more vom- vulnerable too. Um, but let's ha- move on. I think we need to talk about two areas when it comes to the out of possession side of things. Mm-hmm. The first area is that Brighton tend to play a man to man system, and then the second area I think we need to talk about is what Brighton are doing in terms of rest defence, which we can expand on when we when we get there, because that is a fairly s- scary sounding phrase. <laughs> let's start off with this man to man approach that we have. I've got a screenshot here from the Manchester United game which shows up really nicely how Brighton roughly are setting up player to player when Manchester United are trying to build up from the back. Um, and if, there's a few things I think to note. So you can see players play to player match up across the, the pitch but the things that stand out to me looking at it are the ability of when you're playing man to man for teams to actually open out space in the middle because you're always going to have the orientation of, of a player to a, 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 an opposition player. If that opposition player moves out of the middle, then you are creating the space around them. The other thing to note is this 1v1 matchup at the back. Mm. We've already talked about how Brighton like to get into those scenarios uh, the other way around when they're attacking yeah. because when you get into these duels if you have really good 1v1 specialists like for example Karen Mittimer uh, you can you can really benefit from that but there is a, an element of risk there as well in that you know if the opposition struggles to build up they can go long and if you get yeah. a favorable 1v1 matchup that can that can look really um, dangerous for for the opposition so what's your take on the the man-to-man approach that Brighton uh, actually imposed? Well, I suppose the purpose of it is that De Zerbi wants the ball back. He wants to force high turnover, so he's really trying to squeeze teams and, and force them into kicking long. But at times you'll see either a centre-back or a full-back really stepping out um, to follow a midfielder. There was a good example against Ajax where they effectively stood on the ball in terms of build-up and waited for Lewis Dunk, the left centre-back, to step out to mark the number 10. And as soon as he stepped forward, and they tried to kick it all the way over his head to exploit the 1v1 in behind. And out wide here, we've got Jan-Paul van Hecker up against Marcus Rashford. Um, there were potentially some times where Rashford was a bit selfish in the game but he had a high volume of shots I think Um, and that can be you know not quite an easy out but it can be a real straightforward way of attacking sometimes where when they do press and at times you'll get a midfielder or a winger pressing the centre back and then following in to press the keeper on sort of a a double press they do have that option to play it long and in behind so there's an awful lot of trust um, and a lot of pressure high demands really on the centre backs people might remember last season Edison assisting Haaland when Brighton went man to man at the Etihad and Edison kicked it over everyone uh, and then Haaland uh, knocked out Webster off the ball and, and went around Robert Sanchez so it, it comes out really when well the statistics because they're able to consistently press high and they can press better teams often uh, really high as well and, and cause them real big problems I think Arsenal away was a, was a really good example of that last season but it does leave them vulnerable so you get re- really both ends of the spectrum yeah because it is so manipulable right it's when when a player is oriented against another player that player can move out of the way to create space. And we saw with Marcelo Bielsa's leads p- playing in a similar way that that was uh, able to be picked up quite a lot. Now, the other thing we need to talk about is the rest defensive principles that Brighton use. Now, when we say rest defense, it can sometimes sound quite scary, but the general idea of rest defense is when you have possession of the ball, what sort of structure should your defenders be in to make sure that if the ball is lost further down the field and the opposition counterattack, that you can actually make sure it's really hard for them to generate goals in that way. Now, it's important to say, I think, that when Brighton are building up in these scenarios, Often when they've got settled possession, what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and get one of their players forward, usually one of the central midfielders, so Pascal Gross, often sitting in this kind of area to try and make a front five. And what will happen to actually cover the fact that we've lost a central midfielder, these two fullbacks will will come inside. Now what you have is a a sort of fairly nice, what we'd call a 2-3 shape here, because it actually stops the opposition from being able to build through the middle. It offers space in the wide areas, but there's more distance to get to goal if you go that way. Manchester City will defend in a similar way, maybe a little bit more of a a 3-2 shape perhaps, Uh, but there are plenty of teams who will adopt this kind of approach, block out the middle, make it hard for the opposition to get through the middle, force them wide, Mm. and you should be in a good place to defend counter-attacks. But there's a few things that stick out to me, because Manchester City, as we know, have a bunch of really big basically centre backs in this five man unit what we've got from Brighton is one we've taken one of the centre midfielders out uh, we've got full back profiles here so Stupinian Veltman pretty much sort of standard full back profiles I'd say rather than uh, centre back profiles uh, and then we have the, the well Billy Gil- Gilmore in between them not the most physical profile as well then the other thing I think we need to talk about is the width here mm. too because you have Duncan and Hecker plenty of space in the wide areas yeah. we've already talked about fullback areas being vulnerable mm-hmm. that could be a reason why they are vulnerable as well right 
Yeah, absolutely. So the the purpose for for putting the uh, fullbacks in so narrow is that you want to open those passing lanes wide into the wingers and you can then get 1v1 situations, you can access the number 10 sort of running in between and then you generate cutbacks where you can start flooding the box, you can get three or four attacking it. So the, the purpose uh, it innately really uh, is to maximise the, the attacking output and as you mentioned, Billy Gilmore um, is in there because he's such a good ball circulator so we can receive the ball almost in this box if you like between players and he can pop passes wide, he can get on the half turn and try and connect play through. But the problems come really when teams don't want to be counter-pressed and they want to counter-attack rather than sort of keep the ball and regain it. So if Brighton have a turnover, and we saw this plenty against Aston Villa, against West Ham, against Everton, all in defeats this calendar year, and teams will go directly in behind into that space, um, just straight into the areas in behind either fullback. They're perfect. They can isolate a centre-back there 1v1. We saw Mikel Antonio have a lot of success against Adam Webster doing that, Ollie Watkins with the hat-trick, of course. Um, and then you're trusting and requiring your centre-backs to slow things down or be able to make tackles. Um, and of course, it puts them at risk because if they make a foul, they can get you on a card quite easily and then it can put them you know, in a bad position for the rest of the game too. And clearly, Roberto De Zerbi sees this as being a bit of an issue because actually in the most recent match, Brian played against Fulham. Uh, we saw a little bit of a, a switch in terms of the rest defensive system, right? So what we've got here is effectively, I'd say, I'd, I'd probably call it like a 3-5-2 maybe. Um, with the possibility of Gross dropping alongside the other two midfielders, but often, again, playing as a 10, as we've seen him do in settled possession. But the idea here seems to be that you now have three centre-backs, two centre um, midfielders, and then rather than having the full-backs, you've got Mitterman and Adingra playing as, as almost uh, wing-backs. So talk us through this in terms of how you think it solves a few of the problems that we've talked about already in terms of the rest yeah. defensive unit. Well, we were just speaking about how Brighton would often build up in the 2-3 shape, and this is against a 4-4-2 full and mid-block, um, where they'd often pinch the wingers in, sort of narrow to, to cover those number 10s in terms of trying to receive direct passes. So here, you'd have, it was Willian on the left trying to block those passes in. Um, Spurs, of course, played Fulham, and, and they beat Fulham, playing in that sort of 2-3 build-up structure, and at times had to drop James Madison out a lot to try and play through. Um, so you're giving yourself an extra body uh, at the back, so you're allowing, particularly someone like Adam Webster, who's such a strong ball carrier, an eagle to the the side that you can really split these um, outside centre backs even wider and give them space to step up with the ball and try and carry it beyond that first line of pressure. And of course, on the defensive side of things, in terms of rest defence, you've not suddenly got so much narrow, uh, so much narrowness, and you've not got as big spaces to defend. So really, you've got covering the half spaces. You've only really got the very wide parts to defend, but you trust that you can have an outside centre back come, and then a, a central midfielder can come and cover too. Yeah, and I think the central midfielders as well, very different to what we were seeing in previous games where one of the central midfielders pushes forward and then you have fullback profiles fitting in. We now have a much more, I think, defensive uh, rest defence unit here insofar as we've got Dahoud and Belaba a much more physical profile than, than Billy Gilmore as well. So you've just given yourself much more solidity in terms of those counter-attacking moments. But I think we should move on to answer the question that we set at the beginning, which yeah. is, are Brighton being found out this season? So how would you go around thinking about the answer to that question. Well, it's in part tactical that we've spoken about and there's players like John McGinn at Aston Villa who spoke about watching West Ham attack in a certain way against them and teams have at times copied a similar game plan. So there's been ways, I think, not necessarily to find Brighton out, but definitely to stop them doing their plan A that they wanted to do. And then it's a case of how do they adapt with it with a plan B. And we saw the second half against Marseille is a great example of Deserby making tweaks. But as we'll come on to show here, it's also massively a game state thing in that being 1-0 up and Brighton showed against Ajax, they're a much harder team to play against because suddenly at 1-0 down, opponents can't sit off them anymore. Well, not sit off them without you know, accepting, accepting defeat. And when they do come out and press them, those spaces appear, they step higher up and the space becomes available in behind, which is exactly what Brighton want. And so we've got the data here just to show what we mean by game state impact. Um, essentially what you're saying is that once Brighton are up in a game, it makes them much easier to control the, the game going forward. So on this graph here, we've got the, the time period within which mm -hmm. Brighton was scoring goals. Last season, that's the blue bars here. And then this season, which is the white bars here. And I think the thing that stands out to me here is just that first 15 minute section where last season, 16% of goals being scored in that first 15 minute, which is now down to 4% of goals in that 15 minute period this season. That's going to impact the game state that the team are in. And it means that they're, it's going to change the way that they're playing, right? 
Yeah, you saw lots of early goals last season putting the one that up in games and at times, even first halves where they racked up two or three goals. They went ahead early against Palace at home, up against Wolves at home, I think Southampton as well towards the end of the season. And that was also beneficial against opponents that were more inclined to sit off them anyway. Not always against better teams necessarily that would press them for 90 minutes, but getting that early goal meant they had more control for a longer period of time. And this season we've seen them respond really well, to be fair, after half time. You see that over a quarter of goals this season have been uh, in the 50 minutes immediately after after uh, the halftime break. So that has at times been subs. De Zerbi's made um, double substitutions at times. He's made sort of tactical tweaks early on in the half. And they've also got a really good quality of player now, I think, that at times they can impact the game really early. Obviously, the problem with that is, is that if you're chasing the game more, teams are naturally going to sit back against you. So you might have more opportunity to attack or teams will let you have the ball. So scoring late on is valuable, but that's maybe because they've been chasing it, whereas they had a much more even spread of goals last season, which I think was more beneficial uh, for how they wanted to play tactically. And I think the other data we should have a look at with respect to last season is the, the different game states that they were in yeah. uh, by minute. So last season, we can see 27% of the, the time they are in a losing game state, 33% of their time they're in a winning game state, which means that 40% of the time they're in that, that drawing game state, which is very different from this season, because as we can see, both the winning and the losing sections have jumped up and squeezed the, the drawing uh, the percentage much, much lower. So 36% of the time in a losing game state, 42% in a winning game state. And I suppose what what that means then is that what we're seeing from Brighton is that they're really sort of becoming a team that are, you know, extremes. They're either, yeah. they're either in a winning game state or a, a losing game state. What's your thoughts on that? Because it seems to me from everything that we've said today, Brighton, very good on the attacking side of things, have been since last season. The defensive side of things is where maybe there's questions to be raised. But I guess the big question for everyone is going to be, would you rather be a team that's going to be really good at attacking and that comes at the, maybe the cost of defending a little bit or would it be better to maybe sort out the defensive side of things which may pull the attacking yeah. side down a little bit? What kind of team should Brighton be? What should Roberto De Zerbi be aiming for? It's definitely a floor and ceiling debate. I mean, you can see that they're, they're comfortably the team that is in the... Uh, is drawing for the least amount of time in the whole league. So they get really big wins, which you've seen them have numerous times this season. They have really big losses too, and not an awful lot of us in between. I think that it's not quite perfect in the Premier League, but it's really, really good. And it's why they're punching above their weight so much, at least in terms of sort of wage bills and, and infrastructure. Um, but it might become more of a problem in European football where, and we've seen it with Manchester City at times, that having those big crashing defeats will completely knock you out of a, a tournament no matter how good you've been in the in the running before that um you know city numerous times crashing out in quarterfinals sort of multiple seasons in a row under under Pep Guardiola and at times playing a similar way to what the Zerbi would do with Brighton of we're going to stick to our high possession our man for man principles and um, we've seen with city at times being a bit more conservative sitting off a bit being a bit more transitional which Brighton have the, the personnel to do if they need to and have done it a few times now um, so it's a case of how adaptable Deserbi either can be or sort of wants to be and I think it will be if it's going to be an issue anywhere it's truly going to be an issue in, in the Europa League So have Brighton been found out this season? Maybe a little bit um, but they're starting to respond with quite a good plan B so if they can continue to do that then teams will have to find another way to, to find them out so to speak If you like this video please consider subscribing to the channel the Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.